Hey, it's Chris McKay, and welcome to another edition of the Hot Country Podcast. The Hot Country Podcast, being brought to you in part by Passport America and by Surfshark. For more information on these and other sponsors and discounts available, visit hotcountrypodcast.com. When we return, it's ACM Award winner, singer, songwriter, and author Dave Gibson. He's next on the Hot Country Podcast. And this is kind of a special edition of the Hot Country Podcast. Uh, not only are we still finally getting out of that COVID realm, but we're uh, we're recording this in May of 2021. So there'll be some references to uh, COVID and how we've all survived. But I have to tell you, bringing to the microphone today is is an honor and a thrill. A singer, a songwriter, a performer, a winner of the Academy of Country Music, and an author. Well, we'll talk about more of that later. But right now I say, hey, Dave Gibson, thanks for joining me on the Hot Country Podcast. Man, it's a pleasure, Chris. I really appreciate you having me part of the show, man. I've said it a thousand times. I would love to be a fly on the wall, not to interview or to bother, but just to watch country songwriters work. You know, anyway, you take a whole group of people like that. I would just love to pick your brains and figure out how you do it. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. Should I read off your long list of of number ones, or would you like well, to share with people who have no idea until this show <laughs> is over who is Dave Gibson? <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I'm um, I guess I'm just a, a hybrid of all kinds of music. I love all kinds of music. When I was growing up in Texas, and born in Arkansas, grew up in Texas, and and back to Arkansas and went to Chicago and had a band and moved from Chicago to, I'll make this quick, uh, to, <laughs> to Nashville in 82. And uh, believe me, uh, my, uh, I, I don't know how I did it, but it was timing. Everything was timing for me. Uh, I met a guy that, that helped me to start, I mean, I started my career, a guy named Tony Brown, who's one of the greatest producers yes. and piano players played for Elvis and and um and he he just uh he took me in the studio tried to get me a record deal and then my whole songwriting career started I, I became an, uh, not a singer songwriter but a songwriter singer correct <laughs> yes for, for uh for 10 years um uh, and I and Tony Brown cut my first hit back in and uh, the first year I was here, which is unbelievable, uh, called Midnight Fire on Steve Warner. Steve Warner, absolutely. Uh, yes, and that was like uh, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, you know, because uh, it became the title of the album and the first single. And then he went on to cut five of my songs and another hit I had with him uh, called Heart Trouble. Heart Trouble, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so um, I I don't mean to... to, to to, to, to belabor anything here, but Tanya Tucker was my first number one hit. If it don't come song easy. Song. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I never will forget. I was, I was like, man, this is, I made the big time. Now she did it on the CMA awards, which was so cool, you know, and then uh Confederate railroad did uh queen of Memphis, uh, big song, huge song for me. And Daddy Never Was a Cadillac. Cadillac kind. Yeah. I was lucky enough to uh, be writing for Alabama, a company, Maypop Music, and they they cut a song of mine called uh, "Jukebox in My Mind," and Absolutely. and it became their biggest song at radio. Well, it was the number one and the most country thing they ever did, which is you know. <laughs> so anyway. And then about that time, Joe Diffie one, did one of my songs called Ships That Don't Come In. And I miss Joe so much. He was my buddy. And um, it went number one. And I was actually um, uh, at Sony Music myself at Epic Records with uh, Blue Miller. And we had a band called the Gibson Miller Band. And um, this is just a quick run through of, of everything. So you can kind of get an idea of what's going on <laughs> and and then blue and i we our band won the acm award in 93 and, and um and then i left the band in 94 here i am and i do have a book out <laughs> <laughs> so here we go and, and, and again for those who are going uh, dave gibson when you say the gibson miller band i, I have my own classification of of my music world as a dj I always say that 70s was Outlaw, 
eighties was pop and nineties was hot. And and yeah. you and and Blue uh, with the Gibson Miller Band, you you took Hot Country by storm. Interesting <laughs> on the on the charts, it was always you would always see the Gibson Miller Band. You had uh, High Rollin', uh, Red White, uh, what was it? Red White, Blue Collar, Stone Cold Country. Yeah. But my favorite, Texas of course, it, well, I was going to say my favorite, of course, is Texas Tattoo. I don't know <laughs> who the girl is in the video, but. Uh, as as my father would say, uh, hubba hubba. She was just a doll, uh, and and you oh, guys, yeah. you know. And I have to admit, you know, Dave, I I had the same mullet in in '94, <laughs> so uh, it it just all it just all kind of came together there. And a, a lot of people may not know that it, to team the two the two of you up. And and again, um, we lost Blue Miller uh, in 2018. So yes. uh, yeah. I, I, I know that's sadness, and, and my heart goes out to you and the family still. I mean, what a loss to country. Yeah. What the two of you were able to bring together in, was it just two or three years, 92 to 95, right? Right. Yeah. Actually, we started in 91, you know, writing and, and everything. And then Doug Johnson, who introduced us, um, uh, he he became our, our producer and um, became A and R at Epic Records and took us in as the first first act. Yeah. So we were. I mean, my whole my whole career has been timing. I don't I don't know how it's happened, but it's been it's been awesome. Really. Well, has. you know, Big Heart, which was released what in ninety two right. or ninety three, and for those that don't yeah. know, Doug Johnson, um, he was the VP of Epic at the time, right? Right. Uh, yes, he was. He, yeah. he became head of A and R at, at Epic. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 amazing what the two of you did together, and it's surprising it took so long to bring the two of you together between oh. the songwriting and the performing, and and just the general hot country attitude the two of you had. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to reflect back on my buddy Danny Shirley. Yeah. Of oh yeah, uh, and and again, my it, uh, we're recording this. In 2021, just found out just recently that Danny uh, broke his back in an accident, and right, and and I'm, I want to wish the best to Danny. But for you uh, to write Queen of Memphis, and Daddy never was a Cadillac kind. Boy, they sold those songs. I mean, <laughs> that must have been a thrill to turn on the radio and hear that for so long, right? You know, it was really unbelievable. Uh, and and a lot of the the DJs and people back in the day, people who were interviewing us, asked asked me why the, that we didn't cut those songs. Well, it just it just so happens it was like the timing thing. It was they they were out a little before us, and I was I was writing, um, you know mainly i didn't have a record deal and and uh so those songs uh and and believe me my one of my biggest buddies and greatest producers and piano players too was barry beckett and those songs barry cut on those guys and and I, i'll tell you he's he's no longer with us but i tell you he is in spirit with me because he was an awesome guy and he he made those great records, and Danny Shirley sang the hell out of them. Mm. And so I'm like, yeah. so I'm just, I'm a very, very fortunate man. Well, I, I tell you what, Danny is a, is a great. I have not, I have not spoken with Danny in probably fifteen, twenty years. But oh, yeah. I, I, but I, I have to tell you, during the time of, of the nineties. You you mm -hmm. couldn't you couldn't throw a, a stick without hitting a Confederate Railroad CD somewhere. I mean, it was like all right. I, every, yeah. um, that was the decade I met my <laughs> wife, and she was teaching jazzercise, and and for her, you know, half of their library was part of their dance routines. So right. And between you and Confederate Railroad, again, I'm always going to say that is what made Hot Country Hot Country, and then your relationship yeah. with Steve Warner. Uh, who has always, yeah. I mean, I go back to the eighties, you know, uh, what was it? The weekend, um, right, in, right. in, in the eighties and then into the nineties. And then you, uh -huh. uh, you did also don't, uh, don't you give up uh, on love, right? For Steve? Uh, yes. You know, that's funny. Cause that's one of the songs that Tony Brown had originally cut on me. And it was a, a song I had written by myself, uh, you know, right, right before I moved to Nashville, uh, from Chicago, in 82, Steve, I mean, uh, Tony couldn't give me a record deal at that point in time, but he was producing Steve and he said, I need songs for Steve. So that's how 
uh, wrote uh, the Midnight Fire with uh, Lewis Anderson, who uh, I met through Tony. And then uh, the track that um, Tony had cut on me, uh, Don't You Give Up on Love, uh, Steve heard it and loved the song. And then Tony asked me, he said, would you mind if uh, Steve put his vocal on this track? And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> How about uh, yesterday? How about yeah. whenever, you, whenever you want it, whenever you want. Uh, I mean, I was just blown away. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was awesome. Well, the, the relationship you have with those artists and then a lot, and I'm hoping now, uh, people listening yeah. to the podcast are kind of putting two and two together. Just to kind of go in order here as we make our way through time, what would be your favorite? favorite song that you penned whether you performed it or not what would be your favorite and what was the motivation behind it ships that don't come in amen there you go yeah that's my watermark of my career as far as i'm concerned i've written a, a lot of songs uh but that one uh and joe diffie's performance on that song is you know you know in actuality I'll just tell you a little side story. Uh, uh, Joe, actually, uh, his his producer, Bob Montgomery, uh, found the song by accident and um, and played it for Joe. And Joe thought it was great. He said, but you know something? That lyric is pretty heavy. I don't know if that's, I can, you know, uh, that's good for me. Because, you know, he had had more uh, you know, songs like, uh, well, John Deere Green. I don't know if it came out before, but, you know, some stand me up against the jukebox, all right. those things. And he said, I don't know if that's right for me. And Bob said, listen, Joe, go in the studio there and sing it one time. And if you don't want to do it, we won't. And he did. He came out and he said, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're doing this. <laughs> yeah. And you know so, what? It's, it's a signature song for him and certainly for you. Oh, it, it was it was unbelievable. I, I mean, you know, and, and believe me, my... My co-writer, I want to mention Paul. Paul Nelson is uh, one of the great songwriters in Nashville. Uh, he co-wrote with his brothers, 18 Wheels and a Dozen Roses. 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 And I, I was, we were writing another song the day we wrote that, and uh, I wasn't into it. I said, Paul, you got an idea. I know you got an idea in that book of yours. <laughs> yeah. I want an award-winning song. <laughs> so he pulled that out and I don't know where, you know, except from up above, the, the God just shined down on me and gave me those chords, and I started playing these chords, and we wrote that thing in, I don't know, two or three hours, and it's just like, that. okay, that, that's it. I don't know if it'll ever get cut or not, because it's got a word in there that no one's ever used in a country song. Oh, <laughs> oh now, 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 say the word. <clears throat> Um, well, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Say the word and you'll be free. <laughs> yes, it's, it, just, just let your soul, just let your soul go. And then, uh, if I, if, if I get to put you on the spot, what is, what is your favorite song that you did with the Gibson Miller Band? Um. Wow. You know that's hard to say. I. Uh, you know I love them all. Um. Uh, Texas Tattoo has got to be one of my favorite. I mean, th that whole record, uh, Where There's Smoke, has got so many great songs on it. I, and, and I do say that myself because Blue Miller and I wrote most of them. And we, we had pretty much all of our, our, uh, our singles. And we had a writing uh, partnership that, you know, was just like, I don't know, Blue used to say, you know, we're like country Lennon and McCartney. You know, I said, well, I don't know if we're that, <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> but we're we're pretty damn good, you know. And uh, High Rolling, uh, Texas Tattoo, I love my first single, Big Heart, and Blue White, uh, Red White and Blue Collar. That's that's one of my favorites. Well, that means I just have to play all of them, uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> which which is in the library anyway. And and what I love is the fact when I, when I'll play a song, uh, especially by you, you guys were like what do I want to say? The soundtrack of of country line dancing people. <laughs> Every time I would walk into a club in the nineties, uh, Gibson Miller Band yeah. was playing. You guys just. You came in at the right time in the right in the right place, yeah. And and here we are, so many years later, and the again the full circle, understanding what you're doing and where you are. My box of collectibles. 
autographs and promotional items and all the little crazy things that, that a DJ would have in the trunk of his car. But the one that I prized, and it's it's still, I'm putting myself on the spot here trying to remember the name of the book, but was a children's book written by Ricky Van Shelton. And I want to say oh. Quacky or Quacker the Duck or something. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I remember. And sure. it was one of those things where why would a country artist write a children's book? book and i was i i read it and i understood immediately after you read it you don't have to be five i mean <laughs> you can be 50 and understand where the storyline's going but right. it, but i have to tell you it's one uh dave it's one of my prized possessions is an autographed copy of quacker the duck by ricky van shelton so here i go and i'm oh, gathering cool. my material for dave gibson and and what's funny is trying to, uh, I was talking to Nikki Nelson of Highway 101, and she said that trying to find yourself on the Internet, you can so totally get lost with everything that's out there of what people right. have written about you. But one of the interesting things is I was going through yours, they kept trying to send me to a Scottish singer, Dave Gibson, and it's like, no, not oh. that one. Uh, but what I found interesting, it was completely by accident. I had no idea that Dave Gibson wrote a book War at the Ice Cream Store <laughs> with Mustachio Pistachio versus Bully Vanilli. <laughs> who, who does this? <laughs> who, who would write the, at, at, at an ice cream store called the Frozen Frog? So it's like <laughs> I'm reading this. I'm going, nah, Dave didn't do this. And then, I, and then I clicked through a couple of more, and it was like, oh, my God, Dave did this. And 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 then it was like what you and Cheryl DeVega did uh -huh. <laughs> is phenomenal. So welcome to the world of oh. authors, and congratulations. Here we go. Instead of being an ACM Award winner, hey, congratulations on the book tour. What's that all about? Oh, thanks so much, uh, Chris. Uh, you know that uh, it, it all started, and believe me, um, it's just a nut, nutty story. Um, that's one of the lines in the book, actually. <laughs> it's a funny nutty. story. You're green and nutty. Who would want to water you anyway? Mm. <laughs> and and so anyway. For, the, for those that don't know, it's presented by Frank the Frog, so you have to kind of get yeah. into character here. Right. Well, Chris, I don't know if you know anything about uh, a, a song I had written uh, many years ago called The Frog Song. If you look up Dave Gibson and The Frog Song, a Scottish songwriter will not come up. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> and I know that guy. Believe me, he's great. But <laughs> uh, I wrote this wacky little song uh, years ago uh, out of nowhere. I was I was kind of uh, a little concerned about uh, my career is, is, you know, I hadn't had a hit in a while and I had this publishing company that I was partners in and, and the, the people there, you know, they were saying, you know, uh, including my ex-wife, <laughs> she was saying, well, you're not writing the kind of, kind of uh, songs to get on the radio anymore. And I was so mad. I was so pissed off that I, I walked outside. Oh, no kidding. Couple, cup of coffee and a cigar and i'm just sitting there i'm like i'm gonna write something i don't care if anybody ever cuts it i'll cut it yeah <laughs> so well that was all well and good the only problem was i didn't have any idea to save my butt i start writing this goofy song and i take it back in about three quarters finished and i was excited because i thought it was pretty dang good and they were looked at each other and said, "Oh my God, he's lost his mind. Now he's out there writing a song about a frog." <laughs> oh, we're yeah, all Yeah, Dave, we're Dave, not... Dave's gone off the deep end, ladies and gentlemen. Oh yeah, yeah, no, so to speak, in the in the in the waterhole, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I finished the song. I brought it back in, and uh, Bob Separidi, a guy that, that had worked at Warner Brothers for 25, 30 years, uh, DP. Uh, you know, he was. He was working for us at the time, and and I came back in and played it, and he said, oh, wow, that's pretty damn good. <laughs> he said, I, I'm going to pitch that to Kenny Rogers. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> so anyway, Kenny didn't cut it. But that song actually went to number one in, in uh, the U.K. It, oh. did, it did so well over there. That frog turned into a puppet show that, that's called The Waterhole Bunch. Uh -huh. which Cheryl DeVega and I met, and she's a great writer. She she and I started this company called Waterhole Productions, and, and it was all about these puppets in, in a bar called the Waterhole. You know, that was part of the song. 
And um, we we worked on that thing for two years. It's on Roku TV now. Oh, good for uh, you. Yeah, it is it's so funny. There's so many cool little skits. And we did old school puppetry. We built the whole set. But then we did a lot of green screening. And it's just very cool. It's on Spider T, S-P-Y-D-A-R, on, on Roku, 630 on Friday night. We're not on demand yet, but we're, we, we plan to be. Anyway. Frank the Frog is the guy who is 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 the one who is like he's a spokesperson for all the puppets and everything. So he ended up being the ice cream taster at the Frozen Frog. Cheryl and I came out of nowhere writing this. She had written us a little thing and been animated years ago called the Ice Cream Storm. And of course, Frank the Frog. I wrote the Frog song. We sort of combined the, 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 those in a way, and we both love ice cream, you know? And, and so we started coming up with these characters, Bully Vanilli. The Bully Vanilli is the bully of the ice cream store because he's the most favorite. That's who everybody orders. Ah. And, and he doesn't like the other flavors. He thinks they're you know, much, much less than he is, and especially Mustachio Pistachio, you know? It, it's a funny little book, and, and it turns out that this book is is about anti-bullying, and we didn't even start started out to we started out to writing write it like that, you know. But in the end, bully, well, in the end, bully gets licked. Uh, <laughs> bully Vanilli gets licked at the ice cream. Well, I was going to say, there's a fun pun for ice cream lovers. <laughs> oh, this whole book is just full of of crazy puns, and and that's the reason, um, you know, adults like the book too because it's just. It's got a lot of humor that can go, you know, for, it's a kid thing. And then there's just, just good humor. So wait that, a minute. That's, that's, really that's another thing. ice cream pun, right? <laughs> oh yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> From, oh, pun intended. <laughs> pun intended. Happy, happy accident. There you go. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, I hope you don't mind, Dave. I'll put a link to the book. We actually have a website called Frank TL Frog and Friends. Okay, and they, they can go there, and there's a flip book actually that the uh, uh, the puppet Frank and a few of his friends are narrating on each page in a video, narrating the book. So it's very very cool, and there's a lot of free stuff on there too. It's it's like a new edition of the director's cut. Did I hear you correctly? You say you're still performing in Nashville at a club. Which where mm-hmm. are you? Where, where 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 can we find you? Well, my buddy Greg Crow, um, who I've written many, many great songs with, including uh, "Lonely and Gone" for Montgomery Gentry, and Bill McCorvey and I wrote. Um, uh, we play at a place called The Local, and uh, it's right here in Nashville, and it's just a really, really cool bar. It's one of one of the few clubs that really, really the, the owner Jeff Reed he really loves '90s country music. He loves real country music, and they got a lot of different uh, uh, genres of, you know, the younger kids, uh, some of the uh, older writers. And, but we always get our friends up to, to play with us or whoever wants to come in on Monday nights. So we, we, we do this Monday night thing, and uh, we've been doing it for almost two years. We had took off for COVID for two or three months. And then, uh, uh, unfortunately, Greg got uh, – he, he contracted COVID. Uh. And uh, he, uh, he's, he's all right now, but it took him about 14 days to get over that, and it really kicked his butt. So, uh, everybody, if you get a chance, get your vaccine. I yeah. got mine. So <laughs> me, me too. Anyway, Anyway, you don't want to get that stuff. Well, I'm getting a lot more offers for for shows, and uh, just done a couple of uh, a benefit over in uh, North Carolina, and then we went did one in Helen, Georgia. Uh, a lot of songwriting things, and I'm, I'm planning on doing some stuff down in Texas here uh, real soon. But Monday nights we we play here for two hours, uh, you know, six to eight, and whoever's in Nashville or whoever's visiting here to come see us, you know, it's it's really a Really, a cool little venue and great food. So. Well, you mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned the reason how you and I were able to make this podcast happen uh, was Bill mm-hmm. McCorvey, and you mentioned that you team up with him and and make that happen when he has time to come and join you on stage. For those that don't know that name, that is the voice behind Pirates of the Mississippi, another hot country band out of the nineties. 
And, yep. uh, and I, again, full circle, I'm so glad that you and I have had the opportunity to chat for me to learn uh, more and more about you. But again, I'm from the admiration side of this. You are, have been instrumental, no pun intended, uh, with country music of the 80s and 90s to be an ACM award winner. All of that, and like you said, the fun part was sitting back and watching one of your songs being sung. Does it still give you the same tickle every time you hear your song on the radio by another artist? Oh, man, I'll tell you, I'm so honored to have moved to this town and been here almost 40 years. I am probably somebody, one of my writer friends one time told me, he said, Gibson, you are the luckiest man in show business. Mm. <laughs> I said, well, you know something? I don't know about if I'm the luckiest, but but I've been pretty fortunate to have, have met the, the right people at the right time and, and had a, had the right song for, for, you know, for some reason or another, God gave me a gift to, uh, to do this. And I, I can't do anything else. I mean, I, I, I can't, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just in my soul, you know, ever since I was a kid, you know, it's, it's, it's been there. And, uh, uh, thank God I've been able to, to actually, you know, make a living at this business because you know the business as we know the business has changed an awful oh, lot so know? much financially it's it's just you, you you've got to have you've got to have that song on the radio you've got to have it so um that being said i'll i won't say anymore um i i am so proud i really am thank you chris for uh for being uh, a, a fan i mean without you uh and all the other folks out there especially in radio and you know everywhere we we wouldn't do what we do well jeff jeff carson and i had a a conversation and i was letting him know that his his first single that came out was a tune called yeah buddy and it 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 didn't break uh i don't think it broke 60 on the top 40 charts and what i explained was we didn't care the audience loved it and we're Uh, and and we're gonna play it and he said Exactly like you said, if it weren't people like you in radio doing that, because the listener doesn't know where the song is on the charts, they just know they like the song. So, right. And, and I think that the highway station, just to give you a little glimpse of what I did, every man think about retirement. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? In what direction? And mine was, I could never find a radio station that played the music I like. It's gone now. Uh-huh. And and right. that's where the highway station was birthed. When you think about it, some men will spend hundreds of dollars every month on golf. Um, some will rebuild automobiles. I I decided to build a radio station that I want to listen to, and wow. and you guys are part of that. So I, you know, if you're resi- <clears throat> if if it takes off the way that I hope that it does, at least you get a couple of more residual checks, and you'll get the admiration that people are still playing your music because they love it. And again, what you did on your own as a as a songwriter is immeasurable. But mm. I mean, that three years that, that you and Blue were together, you were just phenomenal and will be instrumental of of '90s hot country. So when you just said there's there's nothing else I can do, this is what I do. Well, you would be incorrect if I if you don't mind me putting you in your place for a moment, Dave. You you just keep doing what you do. You, the singer, the songwriter, the performer, the author. I can't wait to see what's next for Dave Gibson. What's, give us a sneak peek. What are you going to do? Make a new album? <clears throat> Maybe uh, design a new car? What's going on? Well, you know, uh, I'm still writing songs. And uh, I, um, in fact, I had a single come out in 9-11 of last year, which was uh, actually perfect timing uh, because the song was called uh, world gone mad <laughs> mm. which which was written two years before that Doug Johnson and Nick Sturms and I and Walker Montgomery wrote the song and it's one of my favorite songs uh, that that I've ever had come out now this artist Josiah Siska is on Black River uh, and which Doug you know Doug is the the, the guy that runs A and R over there and mm-hmm. the song went to social media i mean all the streaming platforms 
And, and you know, I, I don't want to sit here and, and say sour grapes or anything, but we never went to radio. Ah. They never, they never took, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, this song, and, and I don't know if you've ever heard this song at all. You probably I haven't. Have, I have not. It's it's one of the best songs I've ever been, been a part of. And I thought to myself, wow, what great timing is this? And then all of a sudden, it didn't, it didn't actually get on real radio. So, you know what that means. I mean, it's, it's, it's just... Uh, Radio is actually how we make a living right. uh, these days because the social, you know, the, those things, the platforms don't really give you. It's not all about the money, but sometimes it is, you know. But I, I want you to hear this song and, and maybe you, you'll play it on your show because Josiah Siska is a young guy. He was on American Idol right. a few years ago and he's, he's got he's a real country singer. He's from Georgia. And he's like 21, 22 years old. And the guy is a star. And, I, and I'm like, wow, I, I want this guy to really make it. I've written a couple more songs with him. So, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about his career. Uh, and you might, you know, just check him out. Uh, but I will send you that song. I, I was uh, just going to, I was, I was going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just dropping that in a, in either text absolutely. or an email, send me the MP3. Let's add it to the station broadcast of this podcast. I'd uh, love to, I'd love to share be, it with people. Uh, that would be great. You know, cause people need to hear this song. It, it, it's, it's a, it's really, really just so a poignant statement about the state of social, you know, the, the way this, this, these years have been, you know, 20, you know, it's just mad. A world gone mad. <laughs> I was like, wow. Uh, there's a, also a video. You can spend, see it on YouTube. All right, we'll look uh, for it. There's him singing it. Josiah Siska. And he was the one that was on American Idol, correct? Right, right. And then he got his deal on Black River, so. So next next question I would have to ask, now that you've accomplished so many things in, in your young years here, do do people recognize you when they come in the club and they see you one Monday? Maybe not recognize me, but they recognize my songs. Gotcha. I and... mean, most everybody does. Um, they, you know, a lot of the younger people don't quite remember. That was 30 years ago. It's hard to believe. It's just, wow. Where did the time go? I know. And it was a, uh, it's but... a long lost era for a lot of people. And, and again, I think that's why I do what I do. It's a, there was a, it was just a happier time for me. So you, you kind of reflect on uh, hot country. Sure. The nineties were completely crazy. And, and when you come through, I mean, let's admit it. The nineties were kind of, it was kind of a weird decade. We got a whole new group of country listeners and country dancers and <clears throat> line right. dancing and Billy Ray Cyrus. And it was just this cra- you know, uh, Shania Twain. We just had this craziness of crossover. And then, right. but the, the older folks, uh, you know, us in our thirties, when we were in the nineties, uh, had to deal with, uh, the decades prior. So we were able to move through that seventies, eighties, nineties, and into the, the early 2000s, and it was a different time. And, and I'm reflecting on what you had said about radio, and right. a, and that's where your revenue comes from. But, boy, I right. tell you, the things I, – right. I, I love the fact that, that, Dave, that you can go out on Monday night and sit on stage and play. I don't remember, and this will be a, a story for – there was a gentleman by the name of Larry Stewart, and he was mm-hmm. op- opening for another headliner. Right, and I'm sitting in this amphitheater with you know fifteen thousand, and Larry Stewart comes out and he starts singing, and people continue to talk and mingle and carry on, and I'm sitting there looking at people saying, "Do you not know who was on stage right now?" And right. I would say that Larry went through three or four songs, and I tell you, Dave, the the rumble of the people just talking and not giving a crap that Larry Stewart was opening. And then Larry stopped for a moment and he said, what I'd like to do now is play a couple of songs that uh, I, I did with a band that I was part of. And, Uh and he got four chords into the bluest eyes in Texas and the noise and the mumbling of the crowd stopped. And then he had them hooked for the next 30 minutes. But yep. it took them that long to figure out who they had no idea that Larry had left Restless Heart and right. he was out on his Correct. own. It's just one of those things where if I walk in and hear somebody playing in a club, right. I'm gonna know because I'm in the biz. And again, 
here I am rambling while I'm trying to do an interview with you. <laughs> one of one of the things about radio of the 70s and 80s, because it kind of changed in the 90s, was DJs always needed reading material because we, we have between three and five minutes of absolutely nothing to do except cue up the next record. Right. So I would tell people we would read the record label, and that's where you would see things <laughs> like, you know, D. Miller, uh, D. Mm -hmm. Goodman, uh, D. Right. D. Dillon, you would, and you would wonder, okay, well, who is that? So we knew mm -hmm. who the where the writers are, and who the producers were, and who the labels were. And again, the listener didn't care; they just right. knew if, they just knew if they liked the song, they were in. Right. And we right. need to get we need to get back to that. Well, well you know, I mean, I. That that's the one thing that that is really you know r right along the, the time that we were we came out um, in ninety one, we were I'll tell you Sony Music and Epic Records was I mean they were big time behind us, I mean it was like they spent uh you know a lot of money and they they did their best, but the problem was ninety one. I guess you know what happened then. The yes. radio was deregulated. <laughs> yes. And all of a sudden, when you could only own three radio stations in an area, uh, you could own as many as you wanted to. So yeah. all that happened, the big companies came in and bought up, conglomerates bought up everything. Now they own it all. And, and I'm sorry to say this. I, I guess I'm not sorry to say it. They control the radio airwaves. Correct. Whatever you hear out there, and and when you you were a real DJ, you were a guy that that you heard something, you played the crap out of it. You bet. You know, and and you made it happen. You made singles happen for people because you started a fire. I wish we had that. I do. I really do. Well, it it was one <laughs> of those things that I like to share that you know Chris Ledoux used to sell LPs out of the back of his truck. Right. And, and and he needed more and more people. So when you found a, a country radio station that would play Chris Ledoux, it was it would be that regional sound. Mm -hmm. I, I have no problem in San Diego blaring Chris Ledoux. Nobody else would. But <laughs> you know, him, Mark Sissel, the rest of them, let's let's make this thing happen. So very popular in a regional, but to have a well, let's just say it, a, a corporate program director in New York <laughs> City picking the songs that people are gonna listen to in Atlanta, just didn't seem right, and that's what right. that's what happened to corporate radio, and that's what's making little independent um, radio stations such as ours uh, flourish a little bit. We're we're playing right. the, we're playing the music without the influence of some yeah. twenty one year old corporate fresh out of college telling us what we should be playing for. Right. The, you know what I'm saying? So right, it, it's a necessary evil. You need to you need bread and butter on the table, so the records still need to play on the radio. <clears throat> Yeah, and I'm I'm uh, I know I I am I'm a very positive thinking person. Now it's not you know not that I can't go down a rabbit hole here and there and and get a little you know upset about the, what has happened, but I can't con things that I cannot control. I refuse to let them destroy me. Very you good. know, and, and so I I just like wow I got to get out of here. I got to get out of this, and and I that's you know in in a way. Uh, Cheryl and I, we 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 thought the same thing. We've written some really great songs together. We got this puppet show. It's like you know something. Let's just do something different. Let's write this little book, and and, and we wrote this book, and now we're getting all these uh, uh, great little awards on it and stuff. Sure. And and we've already got another book that we finished. And um, so and I also I got to use a little bit of my talent that I went to school for it was a. Uh, I was, you know, went to school for commercial art and phot photography. I mean, back in the day, and I, I sort of was able to use this really cool uh, program and, and uh, do it kind of digitally. And so I, I illustrated the the cover of the book and oh, some no of the inside. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't do it all, but I had a younger gal gal uh, do uh, do the characters and everything inside. But I'm telling you, it was so much fun. And so I, um, I, I'm, re I'm really, I, I love being able to do things that, that I feel like that I have the talent to do and that I love to do. And I, I just, uh, music took over my life early on in, in my career, uh, you know, growing up, moving to Chicago and everything. So I, I just, I just, I don't know. 
like I said, I'm I'm uh, a fortunate person to be here, be here, still doing this. What I what I'd like to do is first thank you again for taking the time to chat with me and to share uh, some really awesome stories and enlighten me on some of the new music. I can't wait to get a copy of the MP3. One of my favorite songs. I don't know if you have any inside story you'd like to share. But if anybody ever watched the movie The Cowboy Way, Mm -hmm. you can't miss Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. (laughs) And that rendition is the Gibson Miller Band. So the next time you see that movie, uh, was it 94 or 95? The next time time you go see that movie and you hear the song, understand it's this guy right here, Dave Gibson, and, and Blue Miller did that for the soundtrack. But is there yes. a story behind that, or did somebody come to you and say, "Hey, can you sing this?" Well, uh, Sony Pictures did because you know we're on the we're on the label, so uh, all their artists uh, became um, artists on the soundtrack. So they wanted a different rendition of Mama's, uh, and we came up. Actually, Blue Miller did it. He came up with a four four version of that song instead of three quarter. It's usually, you know, mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. That like the Waylon and Willie version. Right. Well, we decided to do it four four time. Mama, don't let your babies in a four four time, which sure. really was just so cool. And we ended up getting to do um, our video on um, uh, the Brooklyn side of the Br- Brooklyn Bridge on a barge. And uh, in the daytime, and then at night, we we were Times Square, uh, and and it was so much fun going up there and doing that. It was wild. It was so wild. And then they they used clips from the from the movie in our video. So <laughs> with the Keeper Sutherland and and uh, uh, Woody, Woody Harrelson. Harrelson, yeah, Woody Harrelson, yeah, <laughs> and and and. Uh, McDermott. Dylan McDermott is the bad guy. So Yeah, and that's funny. He became a big star. He is. Yeah, that was it was a lot of fun seeing that happen. So listen, yeah. uh do me a favor, Dave, stay on the line. But what we're gonna do is yeah. we're gonna wrap this up here. Uh again, singer, songwriter, performer, author, ACM award winner. If you hear the name Gibson Miller Band, this is the gentleman right here, Dave Gibson. Thank you again so much for taking the time and and sharing some time on the Hot Country Podcast. Thank you, Chris. I totally enjoyed it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hot Country Podcast, a presentation of the Highway Station. This episode and others are available everywhere you download your favorite podcast. Just search Hot Country Podcast with Chris McKay. Don't forget to help support the podcast by visiting our sponsors at hotcountrypodcast.com. I'm Chris McKay, and thanks again for listening to the Hot Country Podcast.